here today because the Pope is in the is in the city, as most of you would know. So um, even when we were walking to dinner today, there was just a line of like police cars, and um, they were like flashing lights. Everything it was crazy. So if you hear sirens, I'm sorry. I'll try to cut those out. So after showing you guys those two books, I thought I would talk a little bit about each book because um, I got. Um, a fair amount of comments saying that you guys enjoyed me talking about the books that I've read for class and um, I do find it really relaxing sometimes to watch like history ASMR videos. I think there's one that he's French and I can't remember his username but he has like a really low voice and he does um, segments on history and things like that just kind of talking about it and flipping through pages of a book or sometimes it's just pictures like on the laptop but his voice is really soothing and actually um, the information is really interesting as well so anyways the first book is called Subversion as Foreign Policy The Secret Eisenhower and Duel's Debacle in Indonesia and I'm pretty sure yeah this is one that I didn't show you guys before I don't think um, but yeah I ordered it off of Amazon and for students you actually get a free Amazon Prime trial for six months versus the one month free trial if you just, you know, sign up not as a student. So that is great. I have been ordering. I literally order everything online because um, why not? You have two-day free shipping and you can find so many more options. I actually just bought acrylic nails online. So if you guys want me to do a video on um, me applying and doing my nails, I could do something like that. I think that would be really relaxing for a lot of people and then just kind of like ramble while I'm doing my nails or something. But this is written by Adri R. Kayan and George Mc... McT Kayan. I don't know, I guess they're um, either brother and sister or husband and wife. <laughs> so I'll go ahead and read the back because there's a, there's a little summary. Based on access to secret documents and interviews with many of the participants, Subversion as Foreign Policy is an extraordinary account of civil war in Indonesia provoked by President Eisenhower and Secretary of State John Foster Duels and resulting in the killing of thousands of Indonesians and the destruction of much of the country's air force and navy. Audrey K Audrey Kayan is editor of the journal Indonesia. George Kayan is professor emeritus of international studies at Cornell University and author of many books, including Nationalism and Revolution in Indonesia and Intervention, How America Became Involved in Vietnam. So, yeah, obviously this is for my Cold War in Asia seminar class.
day that um, Emperor Hirohito decides to uh, broadcast for the first time ever in history. He has never done a live broadcast through radio or on TV. He's kind of like this mysterious figure that no one has seen, no one has really, like, you know, talked to directly. He never really directly talks to the people. He always talks to his officials and then they pass down, um, you know, things like that. So this is the first ever time that he was speaking to the general public directly through the radio. And um, he basically, uh, you know, twists his own words so that, um, let's see, so I'll go ahead and read the chapter, just, I mean, to read a little bit of the passage, because I feel like the author obviously can word it a lot better than I can. The villagers had gathered around the single local radio over which the single state-run station was received. Reception was poor, static crackled around the emperor's words, and the words themselves were difficult to grasp. The emperor's voice was high-pitched and his enunciation stilted. He did not speak in colloquial Japanese, but in a highly formal language studded with ornamental classic phrases. Aihara was just exchanging puzzling glances with others in the crowd when a man who had recently arrived from bombed out Tokyo spoke up. Almost, she recalled, as if to himself. This means, he whispered, that Japan has lost. So, basically, um, you know, that's, that's what Hirohito was on the radio waves to say, that basically declaring that Jap Japan has surrendered. Um, however, he didn't really word it like that. Um, he said, the Japanese military will be disarmed and allowed to return to Japan. So basically, um, you know, in the book, the woman was really worried for a second because um, many Japanese men at the time were taught, you know, to commit suicide rather than surrender or get ch captured. So she was really afraid that that meant that her husband would commit suicide rather than, you know, admit defeat and come back. So this is the picture um, some villagers around the radio. I am so sorry about that truck rolling by. So loud. So, that's basically what happened. And after that, um, the Americans rolled in, and many Japanese, sorry, my nose is itchy. Many Japanese um, actually looked at the Americans as heroes, because during this, you know, very militarized period of time in Japan, um, there was just a lot of war. A lot of people's husbands, brothers, fathers, sons, you know, had to go off to battle. So at this time, you know, the Japanese people were very just tired of the situation. And the author writes about this um, syndrome called the Kyodatsu syndrome. I'll go ahead and find the chapter on that. exhaustion and despair. So yeah, many Japanese were kind of just run down, exhausted of this type of violence that was going on. Um, people were starving, as you can see. So, you know, the Americans, you know, rolling in with their tanks and soldiers dressed up in uniform really gave the Japanese a feeling of like a new beginning almost, and that they were being relieved from this kind of like heightened war state, if that makes sense. However, as you know, John W. Dower, you know, argues later on, um, the U.S. went in without knowing anything about Japan, anything about Japanese culture, about, you know, their political system, about, you know, anything like that, and um, kind of just forced Japan to do a lot of different things that, that didn't really make sense. So that's like the only way I can put it. <laughs> so um, what I mean by that is um, uh, many of the decisions obviously came from Washington and from um, General MacArthur, who knew no Japanese, knew nothing about Japanese culture, rarely went out of his uh, compound in Japan, in Tokyo, you know, rarely went out of it to even go see people and to, you know, travel around. And I think he had a handful of meetings with Japanese experts and he didn't like them, he didn't use them in his close group of friends, nothing. So, you know, was it really America going in to help Japan? I don't know, right? That's kind of what he's arguing in the book. Let's see what else we talked about. Uh, oh, so one big issue that arose during this time was the emperor. What to do with him, right? 
author tries to explain it, not, you know, say like, oh, what we did was right or what we did was wrong, but merely present all of the background in that decision and kind of lets the reader judge for themselves. Um, so basically, the simple version is that um, Washington thought that Hirohito would be useful later on because Hirohito was seen as such a godlike figure in Japan. He was almost a, he was a cultural icon and almost a religion, you know. Um, so first off, Washington was afraid that if they bluntly just said, you know what, Hirohito, you're going to jail or we're going to kill you, the Japanese people would just erupt into chaos and um, they, they thought that a lot of the Japanese people would end up fighting even harder against the American occupation um, because because of this emperor issue. So they decided to keep him um, in power. Okay, so yeah, that's basically it. Um, there were also a lot of war trials that did go on in Tokyo. However, again, the emperor was never put on trial. And, you know, internationally, a lot of people, even the judges at the trials, were like, how the hell are we supposed to have fair trials if the one person who is definitely responsible for this is not going to be put on trial? So, it's very, you know, wishy-washy. So that was basically the gist of the book, and I highly recommend it, you know, if you're planning to study Japanese history or even Cold War history in Asia. It's a very interesting read, um, and I enjoyed it a lot. So that's Embracing Defeat. And I realized it's already 22 minutes, so I think I might talk about, like, two more books and then do another video. I don't know. Um, or maybe I'll just do one really long video. We'll see. The next book I'll talk about is that I got very passionate about last video, and it's The Korean War by Bruce Cummings. And let me get my notes out for this one. So, this one, this book was written in the 60s and 70s. And um, Bruce Cummings was a Peace Corps volunteer in Korea, and he's currently the chair of the history department at University of Chicago. And he is one of the, um, you know, Korean War experts that is not, that does not have a military or governmental background, if that makes sense. Because he's like an academic, you know. So, again, similarly to Embracing Defeat, This book also goes into a lot of the culture of um, Korea at the time of the war, and uh, many of you now looking at this might say, there's a Korean war, like when was that, you know, um, or like what was that about, because popularly it is actually known as the Forgotten War, uh, because it is not like Vietnam where we definitely lost, and it was not like World War One, World War Two, where we won, so it's kind of known as the Forgotten War, um, that obviously took place in Korea. So, um, basically, this, uh, book starts off with an overview of the war, and, um, what happens chrono chron chron chronologically, um, in the actual war. So, officially, um, Officially, the North attacks in June of 1950, and um, they attack the South. The South, obviously, is, um, like, at that time, America was supporting the South, and they decided to draw a line called the 38th Parallel, which most of you know, to divide it up into North and South, and very quickly, the South, um, okay, so basically a little bit of even why we were in the Korea was because, like I said in the last book, Japan was um, occupying Korea at this time. And so when they surrendered, the South surrendered to the U.S. and the North decided to surrender to the USSR. Um, so now there are two countries occupying, one, what two countries occupying North and South Korea versus, you know, just America and Japan. So that's basically, you know, 
roughly, you know, why it was split up into North and South. So very quickly, the North splits and the South splits, and um, they kind of polarize very quickly. Um, the South obviously following American ideals, uh, whereas the North following Kim, Kim Il-sung, because um, contrary to popular belief, the Soviet Union actually did not have a direct hand in North Korea. It was mainly Kim Il-sung um, and maybe the communists in China a little bit. So, um, basically, Bruce Cummings' book talks about two different sides and how they came to be so polarized and, you know, how it came to be a forgotten war and, you know, argues whether or not we were even supposed to be in Korea. So many people actually at the time um, argued against the U.S. going into Korea because um, many people thought that the North and South Koreans needed to fight a civil war. That's what it was about. It wasn't about the North committing international aggression, which is what the U.S. argued. Um, but actually, it was just supposed to be a civil war and they should have been allowed to fight it out just like how the U.S. had a civil war, just like how, you know, every other country had a civil war. However, the U.S. obviously decided to take a step in, and um, the USSR eventually, towards the end, um, steps in a little bit more in the South. So, uh, the U.S. ideology, basically, why they would support the South and directly against the North is because um, we oppose communism obviously because we are a democracy and the U.S. wanted to stop the spread of communism which they were afraid that if the USSR was allowed to take control over Korea that, you know, obviously that would be communism spreading so that was kind of like that um, Bruce Cummings goes into the history of Kim Il-sung and talks about how he rose to power so I thought I would talk a little bit about that because it's really interesting and I didn't know that much about Kim Il-sung or Kim Jong-il. So Kim Il-sung um, started off as a revolutionary fighter against the Japanese during the Japanese invasion before, um, you know, before the Japanese surrender. And he worked closer with the communists in China because um, when Japan um, conquered Manchuria, which is the northern area of China, um, Korea, North Korea especially sent over a lot of troops to help in Manchuria fight the Japanese. And so in return, there were a lot of people in Manchuria, including Kim Il-sung, who then um, rose to power, you know, because they were fighting well. They had a lot of forces, under guerrilla forces around them. And eventually he comes back to North Korea with his forces. And that's kind of how he rises to power. Um, and obviously he has a son, Kim Jong-il. And then they, um, him and his advisors at the time, kind of like, you know, just breed very selectively. And, um, you know, all of their offspring basically now run North Korea. So that's actually his experience and how he came to be. And actually, he was not, as traditionally seen nowadays, a Soviet puppet by any means. Um, you know, he was very much in control of what North Korea is. And North Korea today is very much what he envisioned North Korea to be, not what the USSR or Stalin envisioned North Korea to be. Whereas in the South, um, the U.S. brought in a Korean who was actually exiled and was in America named Sigmund Rhee. So, first of all, Sigmund Rhee was not well received with the Korean people because he basically was in the U.S. for a long time. He wasn't even in Korea at the time. So that was one problem that the South had. And another problem is Sigmund Rhee really wanted to um, attack the North, actually, in the beginning. And the U.S. was like, please don't do that. Like, that's not smart. And it wasn't until, of course, like, it was kind of like both sides just 
shows very clearly with historical documents and historical um, proof that the South actually committed many more atrocities than the North even did. Um, you know, they just, they killed people by the dozens, you know, by shooting out people, women, children, older people, men, everyone. Um, you know, they didn't really imprison a lot of people. They actually just shot them. Whereas in the North, Kim Il-sung explicitly tells his soldiers not to shoot prisoners of war because when they surrender, you know, they, they surrender, there's no reason to shoot them. Whereas in the South, they actually shot a lot of their prisoners who would surrender. Um, also, um, whenever there were any civilian rebellions, soldiers were sent in, American soldiers were sent in to violently oppress them and shoot them all out. So, that's a little crazy, um, in my opinion. <laughs> so yeah, anyways, um, Bruce Cummings does a really good job of, like, showing both sides. You can obviously tell, kind of, like, his tone in the book. However, I think it was still a very well-written piece, and it wasn't, like, you know, he wasn't, like, saying North Korea was great and that South Korea is actually evil. That's not his point at all. He's merely trying to provide a more clear view, I think, of both sides, and that's one that we might not traditionally follow here in the U.S., and his view is still very controversial today because history is always written by the victors, right? So, yeah. Um, and actually, he argues, um, which I agree with, and a lot of my Korean friends agree with, that the Korean War never ended because it ended on a stalemate. It didn't end on a treaty being signed. There was, There is still no treaty signed between North and South, so they are still in a constant state of war, and that is how North Korea sees it. They see that they are still in a, in a constant state of war, and um, there was nothing that was resolved from this, which is his biggest critis criticism, where it's like, if the U.S. wanted to step in so bad, they didn't solve anything. You know, the situation is the same. There's still that hostility, and um, yeah, so this book. Ooh, I need some water from my uh, NYU London canteen. It's all dented because I'm pretty rough with my stuff. <laughs> um, okay. Yeah, this video is definitely going to be longer, but hopefully you guys will enjoy that. notes real quick. 
Caesar, once the first man, you know, sits on the ground and says, this is, this is my land, and if you come on my land, that's not okay with me, I'm gonna fight you, you know, so that's kind of where the first idea of property, according to Jean-Jacques Rousseau, comes from, and, uh, yeah, so that's where, you know, you slowly then get, okay, well, you know, I want my property to be bigger and better than others, right, because then I have more resources, then I can do more things, whatever, so that's how, you know, slowly, you know, built. Then, agriculture. Agriculture brings tons of people together because on a larger scale, you know, if you want to grow more things, you need more manpower, you know, to sow the seed, to water, everything like that, and that, you know, begins the division of labor. Um, so then, after you produce a surplus, for example, you have enough corn to feed yourself and your family and you still have leftover, then you can start giving that to other people for prices, right? For other people who want corn in exchange for other items, or later on, as we now do, exchange for money. So that's kind of how it all starts out. And then, you know, people with more resources start to have more social class or, um, you know, things like that. And that's kind of like how it gets to nowadays. Um. That was basically, basically the gist of that, of a discourse on inequality. So, if you're interested in a little bit of economics, I think, and just philosophy, then I would recommend this, and I'm sure most of you would have read this in college, but even in high school. Okay, and the last book I'm going to talk about is The a Vindication of the Rights of Women by Mary Wollstonecraft. Wollstonecraft was born around the time Adam Smith published The Wealth of Nations, so I think in the 1700s it has to be. Um, it was, she first published the book anonymously, um, because, I mean, she's a woman and not many women were writing and much less publishing at the time, so she actually, the first, um, publication was anonymous and it sold out within like a week or something crazy like that and so the next batch she decided to put her name on it and instantly it received harsh criticism so in the first week it received great praise even from men um not knowing you know obviously they were guessing that a man wrote it but once they knew definitively that it was a woman who wrote it um she received a lot of criticism for it so mary um her background basically she comes from a lower class uh abusive father, um, and, yeah, her, her daughter is actually Mary Shelley, the writer of Dr. Frankenstein, um, however, she died giving birth to Mary Shelley. So, yeah, um, what is this book about? Basically, about wanting the same rights for women and men, equal rights for women and men, which is basically what feminism is based on, is her book. So, she obviously talks, um, she argues a lot about the education of women and how that really hinders um, the woman's ability to advance in society. And she criticizes that from a young age, girls and women are taught to be docile, quiet, uh, pretty, and charming, and only to make their male counterparts better. And she argues that if given the same chances, women can be just as smart, just as tenacious, just as great as other, as men can be. So, um, she talks a lot about the inequalities and how, um, if given, you know, the right education, women can be just as good as men. Um, that's really basically the point of the book. Um, she does repeat herself quite a bit in the book, however, uh, it is still pretty interesting, some of the arguments that she comes up for. So, I would definitely check out this book, of course, if you're into feminism, into history, um, and kind of want to see where feminism started off, then I would go into this book. So, yeah. Uh, okay. So, that is all I'm going to talk about today. This video is by far the longest video I've ever uh, made, so I hope you guys enjoyed that, and yeah, let me know if you guys like these, and I will continue to do them throughout the year, because obviously we read a lot of books, so um, maybe every two months or so I could have like six or seven books to talk about in a session, and I think that would be pretty fun, so yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed, and